Admiral Mike Rogers, uh, my counterpart over at the U.S. Cyber Command, likes to say uh, cybersecurity is a team sport, and I agree wholeheartedly with that. Each, each one of us in this room has a stake in a more secure and resilient infrastructure. Each one of us has responsibility for cybersecurity. So before I get through the litany of some of the things and the service offerings that we uh, offer through uh, the Department of Homeland Security, I want, to remember, I want to remind everybody that we all have a stake in cybersecurity. And the first thing you can do is put it on your agenda. For those folks who are members of the C-suite or the boards of directors, it ought to be on every agenda because it's part of managing risk. And as managing your companies, you need to be having a honest and open conversation of all the risks that are out there. Cybersecurity permeates every part of your company, from company salaries and uh, HR, human resources, all the way to production. And as a result of that, it needs to be on your agenda in every meeting, in every activity. It needs to be part of what you're making decisions regarding risk. At home, you need to have it on your agenda as well. You know, we've seen a lot of folks that uh, uh, have fallen victims to some very sophisticated actors out there who will go and hunt you down if, um, at, at home to try to gain a toehold into your home systems. You know, for example, your company may invest a lot of money in hardening your systems uh, at work. But how many executives out there, how many of you have taken work home and done work on your home computers before? Okay, I see a smattering of honest people in the room. Not very many. Uh, I expected almost every hand to be raised on that. Okay, all right, now there's a guilty person who acknowledged that she was guilty. Thank you for raising uh, on that. Frankly, we all have done it from one time or another. And we're seeing that uh, there's some criminal activities out there who will try to gain that toehold to go into your home computer, figuring you're going to bring some work home, and then it's going to give them a, a new vector into, the, uh, into your company. So you need to be treating your home systems with the same care and diligence as you would with the intellectual property at work. And for, the, uh, for most folks, a lot of folks are doing banking online now. You probably have that one file on your home computer that has all of your passwords written down on it, all your account numbers and the like. I don't, by the way, not on my, not on my home computer. But you know, if somebody got into your computer, what would the damage assessment be? What's your personal risk? And what's the risk to your, your office? For executives and leaders uh, in the companies, are you investing in your workforce? Are you training them to take the same cybersecurity awareness and considerations that, that you do in the workplace? Are you training them to do the same due care and due, due diligence at home? If you're not, you're missing an opportunity. It needs to be on your agenda. and It needs to be part of your risk calculus. So as we take a look at where we stand in the federal government here in the United States, as Andy mentioned, President Obama has put it on the agenda. And it's an agenda in all the boardrooms and major corporations here in America. As a matter of fact, on Friday, the president is going to be hosting a cybersecurity summit out at, uh, on the West Coast, uh, being hosted on the uh, grounds of Stanford University, where he's bringing in senior executives from many of the major corporations in America to have that conversation and to keep it on the national and public agenda. And over the past few years, the Department of Homeland Security has come a long, long way with its partners in addressing cybersecurity. In 2013, the President directed the National Institutes of Standards and Technology to lead an effort to improve critical infrastructure security and resilience as part of his Executive Order 13636. Now, you probably don't know what that number is, and you probably don't care, but it was really a groundbreaking executive order to help organize the federal government to deal uh, with cybersecurity issues, to better serve the public, and to better organize within the federal government 
to make sure that the federal government itself has a better cybersecurity posture. And he also issued what's called President, uh, Presidential Policy Directive 21, which also uh, helps define who does what within the federal government. And these documents spearheaded a whole of community, whole of government approach to cybersecurity. Now, did anybody, by raise a hand, how many folks out here contributed to the public conversation on the NIST cybersecurity framework? Okay, see, once again, smattering of hands. I thought this was a brilliant way of um, communicating and crowdsourcing and developing a better product out there. And uh, the NIST brought government and industry together. And at that time, when they were doing that, I was in transition between the Air Force and my current position. So I even joined in on the conversation. And I think the product that the framework uh, came out with is actually a brilliant document. And it really, from my perspective, it boils down not to the 92 different controls that are in there, but rather to the five key areas. And these are ones, if you're going to take notes today, I want you to take these down. Because you can uh, implement these controls and these control areas not only in your business, but you can do it at home as well. As you're having those conversations around the dining room table, or around the lunchroom table, or in the boardroom. These five controls from the NIST cybersecurity framework give you the best practices that we have to offer in dealing with cybersecurity. And the first one is, is you need to be able to identify what you have. The second is protect what you have. Three is detect when you're under attack. Four is be able to respond appropriately. And then five is be able to recover. Identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. Now, why is this important? Let's go to the first one first. You need to identify what you have. For the folks that are in the C-suites and the boardrooms, how many of you have taken your information and done an asset valuation on your balance sheet? Do you know how much your information is worth? And do you segregate it out? I contend that very, very few, if any, companies are doing that today. And when I was uh, writing my last book, I did a lot of research on this. And I found, as part of my research, and I see it today in my current job, that most companies don't do that asset valuation. But arguably, next to the people in the company, the most valuable resource they have is the information that's in their computers. The intellectual property, the, all the information uh, about their workforce, uh, and, and think of that as personally identifiable information. But it's all of your information. It has an intrinsic value, and most companies aren't able to articulate what that information is worth. And moreover, I contend that that information that's in those data banks, that information is not all equal. You know, if we go and we use the Orwellian, the George Orwell, version of, uh, you know, all, all pigs are equal, but some are more equal than other. Well, information uh, is not equal, but we treat it as equal. And as a result, um, we may be spending too much money defending information that has little to no value and not enough, or not enough money defending the crown jewels of your company or of your own home information, your personal information. So it's important to protect appropriately. And as a retired general officer, I've always noticed that when other generals or admirals speak, they always invariably quote another dead general, you know, somebody that's out there. So in keeping with the highest military traditions and uh, as a graduate of the War College, I want to remind you of von Molke the Elder a famous Prussian general, uh, field marshal, actually. And his quote, does anybody know this quote? Von Mulkey, the elder's most famous quote. Good, the string continues. But when I say it, many of you will recognize it. Von Mulkey, the elder, said, he who defends everything defends nothing. 
Okay, now, that's proof that I went to the War College and I graduated, okay? But think about it. He who defends everything defends nothing. And let's put that and juxtapose that with the, uh, the issue about information and asset valuation. We see it all the time in my research and, uh, and what I'm doing today. I see this in both the public sector and I see it in the private sector. And I see it, you know, w with folks at home as well. A lot of folks go out there, they just throw all their information into their data banks, and then they, they, uh, uh, they basically say, well, we're going to defend it all pretty much the same. So you kick it out of the, the responsibility for managing the risk, suddenly gets kicked out of the uh, C-suite in the boardroom, down to the server room, which well, the guys in the server room, they're going to tell you, I, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough people, I don't have enough training, to get everything right. So I urge you, as you take a look at protecting what you have, combine that with identify what you have, and make sure that you are protecting the most important things in the most appropriate way. And also, if you recall, I mentioned that continuous diagnostics and mitigation program that we're implementing in the federal government. I encourage you to do the same within your own capabilities. You need to be able to have the capability of detecting aberrant behavior on your network. You need to know when you're under attack. You need to know when a guy named Andy is in your network and trying to hijack that information that has your, your intellectual property. Can you imagine what the people in Atlanta would be thinking if Coca-Cola secret recipe is suddenly posted out there for the whole world to see? We're up in Michigan with you know, Kellogg's Corn Flakes uh, and their recipe. You know, whatever intellectual property there is, that's the type of stuff that you and most folks want to protect is the key information. But you need to detect when you're under attack. We find, and uh, the Verizon uh, Corporation puts out an annual report, Symantec puts out reports as well. Um, right now, the average time from the penetration to the detection is cited uh, in the commercial sector of over 240 days. Think about that. The bad guys have been in your system for over 240 days on average before folks detect that they're in there. That's unacceptable. I'd, I'd like to know when they're coming through the gate, not when they're going out the gate. And I'm sure you will too. So make sure that you're investing in detection capabilities and make sure that those folks that are your net defenders have the right tools, the right training, and the right uh, uh, mindset to make sure that you're detecting when you're under attack. And have a plan to respond appropriately. The time to generate a, a response plan to a hack is not the morning of the attack or the moment when somebody shoves a microphone in your face and says, I want to comment on this hack to your company disclosure of information. You need to be able to respond effectively. And once again, I'll go back to that military experience that I have. You know, when we, uh, when we come into an engagement, we've already practiced and practiced and practiced. And many of us participated in athletics. And uh, some folks may remember the famous Notre Dame football coach, Newt Rockne, from the 1930s. Newt Rockne said, practice makes perfect. And then this guy in the 50s and 60s named Vince Lombardi came along. Um, they named the Super Bowl trophy after him, for those who aren't from the United States. So the Lombardi trophy is awarded to the Super Bowl champion. Lombardi said, that nah, Rockne was wrong. Practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Are you practicing for your, what you're going to do to respond to a cyber incident? Are you doing perfect practice on what's going to happen in a cyber incident? Do you have a, a media relations plan to preserve your brand and your reputation? Do you have cyber insurance to make sure that your equities and your risk is best managed? Because, you know, as you can, you can uh, do a couple of different things with risk. You can accept it, you can avoid it, you can transfer it. There's a lot of things that you can do. You can mitigate it. Make sure that you have a plan. 
to how to respond appropriately. And there's been a lot of examples in the press over the last 10 years where that microphone does get shoved in the face of an executive, and the executive didn't know what to say and dug themselves into a hole. Likewise, there's been an equal number of incidents where they shoved the microphone in the face of the executive, and the executive said no comment, or the company had nothing to say. Can your brand, can your reputation withstand that? Are you resilient enough to recover? Being able to respond helps you with recovery. Having that re uh, recovery plan is important too, and you need to practice that. How many times does your company practice a major disaster with its IT infrastructure, like a hack or a physical disaster? I used to be the wing commander at uh, Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. Commanded 12,000 airmen, uh, sailors, and uh, Marines uh, down there, and it was about five miles from ground zero at Hurricane Katrina. I was in Iraq at the time the hurricane hit, and then when I came back from overseas, I was appointed the commander. And my job was to help rebuild the base. Uh, thanks to Trent Lott and the members of Congress, um, we were very, very successful. And uh, the base uh, recently won best base in the DOD. But you know, it's amazing what a billion dollars will do for you. But we had a plan to recover. We knew that if there was, in fact, going to be a major disaster, like a hurricane, there was going to be some damage. Do you have that same type of planning for your company? What about at home? You know, I recently had a catastrophic and emotionally draining uh, hard drive. I had an external hard drive with all of our pictures for the family. And that was really important to us because as we moved around a lot during our military career, we gathered a lot of pictures. The drive died. Now, I did have a backup to the backup. So it wasn't catastrophic, and my wife didn't kill me. I could have been killed, though, had I not had that backup to the backup. I was able to re, uh, respond and recover because I had a plan. And oh, by the way, I exercised it. I do that at work. I do it at home. How about you? So as we take a look at that NIST cybersecurity framework, I contend that it is, there are five great rule sets for both at home and in the office. It's something that uh, should be part of that discussion in those annual board meetings. And having been a director uh, before as well, I can tell you, as we're taking a look at, uh, at those board meetings, we want, to, we want to assess the risks in the board level. We want to make sure that our corporate officers are doing the right things and doing due care and due diligence. And that framework to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover, it's more than just cyber. It's part of that cybersecurity framework, but you can apply it to anything. So, given that, I'm going to give you now uh, the sales pitch on DHS. What are we doing for you? And how can you benefit from some of the things that we're doing? I know that's on the tip of everybody's tongue, and that's why you came here to see me as opposed to get up and enjoy that great coffee and the, uh, the vittles that uh, Andy and the team have had. First thing, uh, we have a thing called the C-Cubed Voluntary Program. And that stands for the Critical Infrastructure Cyber Community Voluntary Program. And that's for companies, and particularly critical infrastructure entities, but all companies, to help adopt that cybersecurity framework. And we have tools and we have teams that are available to you. If your company wants to adopt the cybersecurity framework, uh, we can help you do that and bring that into your uh, company. We do that through forums for knowledge sharing, uh, collaboration with other partners. We provide technical assistance, tools and resources. And then we also help with risk management communication. A lot of companies out there, particularly the small and medium companies, they, uh, they need a little help. And they need to uh, get some information from the neighbor cyberhood watch to find out what the best practices are and how to incorporate it into their risk calculus. We also have um, some, uh, some capabilities such as the Cyber Information Sharing and Collaboration Program, or CISP. C-I-S-C-P. Okay, once again, I don't like acronyms. 
But using the CISB, we can make sure that we are sharing information to get out to as wide an audience as possible. And we also are uh, doing things such as cyber evalu the cybersecurity evaluation tool that's offered through our industrial control system CERT. You can go online and you can uh, go to your favorite search engine. You can Google, you can Bing it, Yahoo it, or whatever. And just put in there ICS space CSET. And it's a tool that you can download and use to measure your own company or your own, your own home as far as what your risk exposures are. And it'll help you identify where your risks are, and then you can make some value-added decisions as to what your next steps are. We do capability resilience reviews for companies that come to us from the critical infrastructure, where we actually send out a team, uh, or we do it remotely to do vulnerability assessments and to identify for our critical infrastructure what they can do to improve their cybersecurity posture. But then we also do um, the, the major cleanups on aisle six, you know, when there is, in fact, a spill. Both of our uh, computer emergency teams uh, go out in the field, and we've, we literally have folks out every day. Uh, we also uh, help prevent incidents. For example, uh, we were out in Arizona for a major event at the beginning of the month. Um, perhaps some of you watched it on TV. And if you didn't, quick quiz. It's second and goal from the one with 20 seconds left. Do you run or do you pass? I'm, I'm hearing run from over, over here. If you've got a guy named Beast in the backfield, do you think you give a guy named Beast the ball? I, I don't know. We go out for major events um, to uh, make sure that beforehand we do a cybersecurity exercise with those entities to make sure that the lights don't go out, that the, uh, uh, the venues are safe. But we also do the cleanup on aisle six after bad things do happen. We do the forensic analysis. We publish joint indicator bulletins. We publish malware initial finding reports. So if there is, in fact, something out there, and oh, by the way, we're going to be publishing a new report on uh, a piece of malware or malicious software called Dyer, D-Y-R-E. We're going to be publishing that, uh, an update on that, because we found another variant yesterday. And uh, we put out joint indicator bulletins working with our partners in the law enforcement community and with industry to help raise the bar for everybody in awareness. As a matter of fact, we had a, working with the Secret Service who has jurisdiction over financial crime, we found a point of sale vulnerability, you know, where you swipe your card and you, uh, the point of sale. We found a, uh, a piece of malware in that. We, it was called the back off malware, B-A-C-K-O-F-F. -F. And on Ju July 28th, we put uh, out a public alert on that with some, uh, not only here's what the malware looks like, but here's what you do about it. And a certain company, I can disclose this because they went public on it, uh, UPS, the, the brown truck folks, they picked it up, their IT staff picked it up that day on the 28th of July when uh, we put it out. They scorned, uh, scanned their corporate networks, didn't find anything, but you wouldn't expect that because it was a point of sale system. But then they went out to their franchisees and out of their uh, 4,574 franchisees out there, they found 51 infections and they were able to institute the mitigation techniques that we put out and they were able to uh, contain it with uh, nominal damage. So, you know, that's a, an example of some of the things that we put out uh, for our products. We do incident response. We help folks respond and recover, but we also make sure that we uh, get the best practices out there. It really is a cyber neighborhood community. I'm so glad to see you here. I look forward to your questions during the panel. But as a community, we need to work together to make our countries safe, secure, and resilient. Thank you very much, folks.